Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn from Focus Compounding here today on the first podcast of 2023 on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Go to focuscompound.com to get access to investment write-ups on individual stocks and various investment topics going all the way back to 2005 uh, by Mr. Jeff Gannon. Uh, you could get all of that for free at focuscompound.com. If you're interested in learning more about our money management services, reach out to me at andrew at focuscompound.com. And of course, you can get more information on that uh, on the Invest With Us tab at focuscompounding.com. So Jeff, happy new year. How was new year's? Did you stay up to midnight? Uh, yes, I stayed up till midnight. It was fine. It was fine. Very good. Did you, did you have a party? What'd you do? Spend some time? Uh, I had the some ball drop. What? I did not watch any ball drop. I had, uh, some people visiting. Very good. Mm -hmm. I was in bed by, I think 11 o'clock. Really? Really? So here's something that I have not discussed much on the podcast. I am a father, as you know, Jeff. Uh, I have a five-month-old at home, and I think that's what happens when you enter fatherhood. You are in bed and asleep by 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve. So I was deep in my slumber, probably dreaming, and I woke up the next morning, and boom, it was 2023. All right. Well, for Christmas, I had people visiting that have a one-year-old, and they definitely are not in bed by midnight. Okay, then. Was the baby in bed, though? <laughs> yeah, they're usually up and about when the baby is down. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's so funny, too, Jeff. So it was the first, this would have been, I think, January 2nd, right? It was Monday, I believe. You know, I woke up. It's the start of the new year, Right. It's, it's the first day of the new year, 2023. I sit down at my desk early morning. I'm an early riser. I'm like, let's go, 2023. Scrolling through Twitter, I'm reading the Wall Street Journal. 8.30 pops up. I look at the quotes. And I'm like, wait, these are still the quotes from the previous Friday in 2022. I was all amped up and ready for the year. And I didn't even know that the market was closed on Monday. And the, the market wasn't open. I was so disappointed. I was so ready. I still worked the whole day. But I did think to myself, I was like, I know for a fact, I am not the only one that thought the markets were open today. And that the second or whatever day was Monday was the first day, the first trading day of 2023. It was kind of a letdown, not going to lie. Well, I think the uh, market observes all the holidays just like the post office would and stuff unless it's the last day of a quarter i think that's the only time they won't do it so yeah so if you don't get mail then you're probably not going to get stock trading. Mm -hmm. yeah so what are you gonna do i mean sometimes when we have new capital coming in and stuff i have to be at the computer to put the capital to work make some trades and stuff across the firm that i do get from you on various mm -hmm. trades to make and I was like, wow, okay, I guess the market is closed today. Let's put some good to cancel orders in and revisit this tomorrow morning. Well, it's a pretty dead time anyway for uh, stock stuff, I would say, right? We don't hear much mm -hmm. from anybody between Christmas and New Year's around that time, I'd say. Yeah, for like liquidity, even liquidity purposes in the market too. I feel like most people are just yeah. kind of checked out at that point. So... I thought this was interesting. We spoke about this last year. This was Charlie Munger's uh, <laughs> holiday card, right? That he sent out last year. I like So it says, still here. And Monish Pobrai just tweeted this today. He This was uh, Charlie Munger's holiday card this year. Still enjoying each day. And he's just sitting there fishing. 99 years old. January 1st, correct? This is his birthday, I believe. Is it? I don't know that, yeah. Yeah. Wow. 99 mm -hmm. years old. There he is fishing. And then I don't know if this was from this year or last year. For some reason, I feel like this was last year, but he included it in this tweet when Warren was wearing a shirt saying, you can never have too much love or too much gravy. 
and then he added a subtitle or too much Charlie. Happy holidays. I believe that was last year. But anyways, I thought it was funny to see Munger sit in there fishing and hopefully enjoying life at 99 years old. Pretty crazy. You think about how much the world has changed in his lifetime. And Mm -hmm. I always think about that. Sometimes you hear of people that pass away in their late 50s or 60s or 70s. I mean, if you live until your 90s, there's just so much more life that is lived as opposed to obviously in your 60s or 70s. You know, it's crazy how much the world has changed in 99 years. Yeah, think about it. When he was born, actually, so he was probably around kindergarten or something, I guess they would have been the first, um, maybe a little bit younger than that, the first sound movies, for instance. So he was born into an era of silent movies. Radio was big, but you know. Um, so when we talk about any of those things, about the differences, and even when his career started and stuff, you know, there were other stock exchanges, regional stock exchanges you could trade on. He was in California and won. Um, totally different, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's talked a lot about how he lived through the Depression, obviously, when he was younger, and how... Um, the world is ran by envy and not greed and how much the world has improved since the times when he was growing up and people are still, you know, moaning about things they don't have or whatever. Uh, but it's just crazy. Yeah. Lots of things have yeah, changed. I, I always find that funny because uh, there was a post somewhere once that was like, oh yeah, these things worked for Ben Graham when he was investing, but what did he have to go through in his career? It's nothing like what it is now. Well, Ben Graham started and Wall Street World War One was about to break out. And uh, it shut the market shut down for like half a year or something. It was the worst ever uh, shutdown of stuff around the world. And um, he two world wars, Great Depression, stock market going down eighty nine percent. And then also, of course, you have really believing that there would be uh, nuclear war. I mean, at various points in that time, and people are talking, you know, now like about whatever things happen with pandemics and all of those sorts of things as if these sorts of things have never happened and it doesn't work in this kind of world, you know. Um, it's easy for us to overlook the amount of disruption in the past, right? Whenever anyone mentions like how fast things happen with the internet or cell phones or something, you show a graph of how fast things happen with cars or radio or any of those things, how fast um, they that they happened. And, you know, they're very big changes. Do you think an investor's investing style is sort of bred out of the time when they start investing, like what the environment was like. So do you think Ben Graham, his style of investing very much was from the fact that he started during a time and invested through a time that was pretty like doom and gloom? Um, Yeah. I mean, he didn't start during a doom and gloom period. Actually, he started in a really uh, crazy bubble period. I mean, not started, but it was pretty optimistic period there. Um, when he really got started investing his own money and everything um, in the 20s. And then he lost basically everything, even though he thought he was and was being a lot more cautious than most people in the market still using margin and things like that. Um, you would end up with huge losses. So, I mean, obviously he was behind and couldn't hit his high water mark and stuff for, I don't know, seven years or something probably. Um, so I think your personality and also the time you grew up in that way. You know, mm-hmm. um, so I mean, similar with me in that uh, I started investing, as we mentioned many times in the late 90s. And so that experience in that bubble and everything after that and the success of value investing versus other kinds of investing in the like three years plus when the market was down and then slowly recovering back to where it had been, uh, value still did very well throughout that whole period. So, you know, um, if you invest in the late 90s, early 2000s, You'd be a big believer in that. And that's the other part of it is you go with what things worked for you. For some people, it's what things worked for them recently, maybe is more the influence. But for anyone, if you get started and you're successful right away, you're influenced a lot by that. And so if there's an inefficiency that slowly goes away where you can't take advantage of that, then you have to kind of change your methods and everything. But that's why you stick with it. And I think that's what people overlook when they talk about you know Buffett's transition from net net investing and stuff like that into more the Charlie Munger approach is the net net stuff was working and there was more of it available. So you have to change when the opportunities that you see uh, change. And not only working, I mean, but obviously made him very rich. I mean, certainly like the richest of the rich, quite frankly. 
at the time. Right? Yeah. And that's some of why I sound um, more saying like things are expensive or something stocks, because I remember a period in the late nineties and early two thousands when perfectly good small stocks, they just weren't the leading stocks, you know, um, went for much, much lower prices than they have, you know, recently. I recently did a screen looking for things because we had done that where we talked about uh, the um, idea. It was Todd Combs. It was from that talk, that actually, where the idea of the 15 PE, 50-50 uh, chance of growing by 7%, and you're sure, basically, 90% confidence it'll it'll um, have higher EPS in five years. So I kind of created a screen very simple where I could eyeball it that kind of would work along those lines. Uh, the screen wasn't designed that way, but it would give me a list that I could look down and see. And I was horrified because I don't normally look at these stocks. Uh, of those that do have like the 90% sure to have higher EPS in five years, um, things that might qualify, especially bigger stocks, but even mid cap and, and small cap stuff, just not micro cap, just not overlooked like we focus on. Uh, so many of them, when it seemed really clear that they would be sure to have higher EPS in five years, they might be able to grow 7% a year. They're trading at 40 times earnings. Crazy. The only things I was finding were things that have unusually high earnings due to COVID, right? So their PE looks low, but it's not really low, and everyone knows that. Um, and maybe some things that are like, uh, so your, your home building things, your things related to home building cars and things that people have this expectation are going to be really bad. Uh, in the year ahead. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, huh? When you're finding a bunch of stocks on these screens that are at 40 times earnings. I mean, we talked about in the final podcast of last year how the best case scenario for EPS targets for this year, the market was basically trading at what, 16 or 17 times the bull case for 2023 EPS. That's pretty pricey, especially if a normal piece probably closer to 15 and just with everything going on. Yeah, so we've talked about, you know, when people ask, like, what stock would you own forever or whatever? And that always comes up because whatever ones we can name in the S&P are quite expensive. You know, we'll say, you know, people ask because I said I bought FICO a long time ago, but it was at, you know, about 10 times um, back then. And it was at the bottom of a credit cycle, not, you know, in the middle of it or something. So. So what does one do? Yeah, you know, FICO 40 times, 41. Well. I mean, one is the, whether it's good news or whatever, is that as stocks become more expensive, the expected return for them is lower, right? So even if you think it's a good idea to own them versus alternatives, that was the Tina idea and all of that, um, they could stay at the same prices or not go down, but no matter what, their expected future returns do drop, right? Mm -hmm. So when you now can get 4%, basically in you know reverse repo type stuff so basically just putting your money into a money market um that's basically just leaving at the fed for the most part um you're getting about four percent and so as that gap closes where you think well maybe i think the market will normally do eight percent but if i think it's overvalued then it's a bit less than that on this forward expectations and i'm getting four percent or something by leaving it in cash it starts to get competitive and so you can of course wait and see it as an option to buy more things in the future if they drop right it's harder when you're getting nothing on cash um, because then you know you are waiting out there and there is some return expected in stocks even when they're pretty highly priced um, now they can get so high that there's that they're expected to return you know negative numbers over 15 years or something but a lot of stocks that are just a little pricey that are good businesses still give you a positive return over time. It's just not a very good positive return. Yeah. So we could jump into the podcast. We don't have much hit on with the markets considering we are about four trading days in. I wanted to bring this up because at the beginning of last year, I believe you had spoken about how 2022 could probably be the first year in some time where bank deposits um, will have like a negative year over year growth. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of interested just to revisit uh, banking and financials in general, just to hear your thoughts on it, um, given, you know, where we are at with the yield curve and the current state of the market and the economy, and just to generally hear your thoughts on banking and financials in general. So, I mean, I think it tends to have a pretty big impact on the stock market, financial conditions, and on um, parts of the economy which later have a big impact on other parts. So 
home building and, and other things that are financed and other things that are related to that. So homes, cars, things you put in your homes and your cars, you buy along with them, all of that. And so it kind of goes from that over time to hit other parts of the economy. So the last part you saw there where bank deposits dropped and that's a bank deposits in the U S are pretty good, easy to find measure. That's close to what they call money, zero maturity. So there are other things included in that, which is a good measure of, of money supply. But um, basically in the U.S., bank deposits are pretty close, pretty good for that. So um, what that means is that, you know, you, you've got contracting money supply, which we've had for the last year. You know, it's, it's you know, we're now doing year over year numbers, so we see it going negative, but we've had it for a while uh, where that was expected. So, um, and you had some tough recession type things happening in different parts of the economy in that period that you see the negative money supply growth from like 30 years ago. It was just kind of rolling problems in, in Texas and in New England and California all at different times, but there was big problems um, there and big problems for those banks, obviously, in the years just before that and then when money supply declined. So normally, as you can see there, it's usually quite positive. And uh, this is how the Fed slows things down and tries to get inflation under control. Do you have any thoughts on financial stocks? Uh, it really depends very much which stock. So there's a few things happening. One, I think price to book is useless. Um, a lot of people have talked to me about price to book. I think price to core deposits is always something I prefer using for banks anyway. And what's happening with banks, um, that are uh, especially smaller banks which is almost all the banks except the very big ones would count as this is that like for regulation and stuff it's not very important to them what their um losses are on their their securities that they're going to hold to maturity right but they're going to book those as other comprehensive um income which is in this case is other comprehensive loss uh which will change their balance sheet so what you're going to see is that for some banks they're uh, book value is declining at the same time as their earnings are increasing, right? And so that will give this impression that their price to book is very high. But if you look at the stock price, you're going to see that it hasn't really moved that much. So what's happened is that the for, for some of them, it hasn't moved nearly as much as the change in the multiple. So what's happening is the price may be going up a little bit and the book value is going down a lot and that's throwing things off. And uh, that's an accounting thing, and I think it's not terribly important. To give you an idea, the Fed's book value now is negative because these banks own the same sort of thing, uh, the same sort of securities as what's on the Fed's balance sheet, which caused these problems. And so the Fed will have large losses for a while in this same category. Um, and so all that means is the Fed won't send any money to the Treasury, which it had been doing before. But the same sort of thing with these banks. They're in the same kind of position, and you'll see it the same way. And that's because of the they... Um, bought securities, which now short-term money yields as much or more than these long-term securities that they bought. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is skewing some people's feelings about the how expensive some stocks are. I would always focus on, like I said, like for a bank that has low cost deposits and everything, really what are those deposits and how much can they generate from that? Um, and that kind of doesn't change as much. Now, deposits didn't really grow last year. And so many banks might have somewhat lower deposits or very close to the same deposits or whatever, but they're not going to show huge declines in deposits as opposed to um, book value. The one thing I want to apply that to, though, is sometimes people do that calculation for me because they know I, I like price to deposits on sort of all the things the bank calls deposits, even if those are, for instance, deposits from other banks, other financial institutions. I wouldn't count those, for instance. I don't think those are very safe deposits or very low cost. That's very hot money. Um, so that's like correspondent banking that they would get that. You could also get it in very large um, sort of accounts that are, are basically just like money market type accounts and some other things like that. What I'm talking about really is, you know, transaction accounts, but savings accounts that are attached to um, businesses and and uh, households that are customers of the bank and that's is their main bank, I think are acceptable in that kind of category. But I think that's important to know because when we talk about banks, some of them have a lot of that and some have very little of that. And one thing you'll see is the change in the deposits will be different depending on that. So like I was talking to someone where there was a bank that had very large declines in deposits because they were from other banks. 
And, um, you know, it's hard to predict how much that could change or how much you have to increase rates and things to retain any of those deposits. Can you explain the accounting concept for those not familiar, uh, especially as it relates to smaller banks with um, the book value, the price of book value going higher um, and that whole concept with the securities portfolio? Sure. So banks, let's say a bank holds loans. So let's say a bank like Frost is a good example. We could take that because Frost is about a third, a third and a third, meaning that it changes, but about a third of Frost's um, uh, asset side of its balance sheet is money held at the Fed effectively. So uh, it keeps about a third in money held at the Fed, and then it has about a third in loans, and then has about a third in securities. Those numbers change a little bit, but what you're seeing there in the quarterly one is basically, and they break this down more in detail, you know, in the filings, cash and equivalents is basically for Frost money at the Fed, pretty much, or effectively similar to, it could be moved either way in a week uh, sort of thing. Um, so it's very short term money and it's either at the Fed or it's in very short term stuff that's effectively the same as it being at the Fed. Then you have securities and investments, which is what we're talking about. And then you have loans, right? So the loans obviously are not being traded and repriced all the time. However, the securities are either being traded and repriced or they're held to maturity and you have marks that you could use of what their fair value would be because of other securities that are similar to them that do trade or models that you use that effectively do, do the same thing for you, right? So this is like when we talked about the um, financial crisis or something like that, you know, the, they would argue over what the proper mark on it should be, but they're trying to market to market effectively. So what's happening is that the cash flows are not changing, right? If it If you had... $20 billion in securities and it was completely static. You weren't adding, buying new securities and some weren't maturing. Of course, that is happening all the time. But if it wasn't, then you'd be getting the same uh, income, interest income off of it all this time because the coupon is the same. However, the price is changing because we're seeing the yield change. So when the yield goes up, that means the price is down. That's all that yield is, right? Because it's a constant coupon. So the uh, when you they always like to talk about yield uh, in the media, right? They never like to, like to do any sort of index of price or create something for you so you can get an idea of price. But what you're seeing is that there's changes in price, which is the yield. So the easiest way to think about it is dividend yield on a stock you own, right? The dividend yield can go from 3% to 4% because the stock dropped. Probably this year that happened to a lot of stocks. The dividend's pretty much the same, but your yield is up. That means your price is down. So if you're marking it to market, which is what you're doing in your brokerage account, um, then you saw a loss on that, right? But fundamentally, you own the same thing, right? So the issue here is that before this happened, I was always concerned and always talked to people about the fact that insurers and banks that owned long-term securities, and not even long-term, but just things five years and more, for instance, um, are very exposed to mark-to-market losses, and so that you should be cautious about that in terms of giving them full credit for it, but you can give them full credit really for the cash flows, right? For the income that's coming off of it and everything. And that's what we're really talking about. And so this is not a situation where these uh, securities are distressed, like take Frost, for example, they're usually um, obligations of the state of, uh, they're obligations of things inside Texas, which often are guaranteed by a state fund in Texas as well. So they're municipal things that are often also guaranteed in a way by a fund that the state of Texas has. So um, they're similar to like state debt. Um, and, you know, the conditions of the state of Texas and the municipalities and everything, it's not, uh, it would be not that different than owning sovereign debt of something other than the United States. It's not quite as safe as owning U.S. debt, but it's probably not all that different than owning the debt of most other developed countries. Um, so that's basically just a lot of bonds and stuff. Um, they do own other things too. That gets marked down. And sometimes the marking down of it can be significant because of what we saw with um, the change in yields, right? And the good news and the bad news is for a bank or for an insurer or whatever has to do with the duration. So how much of it is, is maturing soon? As it matures, you go out and buy other securities, which now will have the higher yield, right? So what will happen here is that we will see um, declines in comprehensive income, so losses that will reduce book value. 
But then as those things mature, the cash will be put into something which then has a higher yield. And so it'll appear that they now have a higher yield in the future on things, right? Um, it's always a problem either way when you give too much credit to that and, and then when you have this happen. A lot of times, uh, you know, companies will say, oh, you know, th they kind of don't talk about it on the way up or they're getting a benefit from it. Um, but they do talk about it on the way down that this was just, you know, it's like, our real estate is the same real estate we had before, but now we're saying that it's worth two thirds of what it was before, right? It's like buying so, a bond, right? You're still getting the same coupon. It's just if right. rates rise, the value of that bond goes down, but you're still receiving the same cash flow from it. It's a very similar yes. concept. Mm -hmm. Now, some banks uh, will have like trust departments and stuff, and they're also asset managers. And so those things often will be charging a percentage of AUM, which is marked to market. And so if they declined 20%, let's say last year, because they consisted purely of some uh, long-term bonds and stocks, um, then their AUM, if they didn't bring in money or have redemptions and stuff, is down 20% and their fees are down 20%, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, to keep that in mind, the same way that you would keep in mind if you were charging a fee on any sort of thing that could go up or down a lot, right? So then how would you think about, I guess you talked a little bit about that earlier, how would you think about the book value then because by everything that's going on because rates have risen and the securities portfolio has you know gone down and with the comprehensive income uh shareholders equity is less than what it was a lot of these companies look like they're trading at higher price to book value so you're still saying that you would not use price to book value as your starting point for valuation or how you would think about it right when i wrote up the banks for singular diligence that's the way i would do it now which is basically to take and it's basically how to insure too, take the um balance sheet that they have apply some idea of what the cost is and then apply some idea of what yield they could get on that and then you come up with a normalized idea of what sort of earnings they should have on that size balance sheet um that also gives them credit which price to book does not for having lower cost liabilities and lower all-in cost liabilities. So just a lower cost bank in general, which is very important. Um, and the same thing with insurance stuff. You, you wanna do the same thing, which is that you don't wanna use the, the recent results that they have, but to give some general idea. And so when we did that for banks like Frost and stuff, um, going back now five to seven years ago when we did these things about banks, um, the idea there was that you were getting 0% and then you're adjusting it up to say a different number. The number we thought was four, basically, but what we said was like three, because that was a number, you know, that would sound more reasonable to people and stuff. But based on what, you know, doing what research we could and whatever, we kind of said that the there's not a great deal of reason to believe that a normal level for short-term money would not be close to 4% um, based on historical things. The Fed might have some bias towards allowing more inflation than they say or whatever. And maybe that would be 3%. Maybe things have changed in the economy enough that 3% is the one that makes more sense now. But basically we're saying that money was earning nothing and it's going to earn more in the future. So you have to give credit to firms like Progressive and Frost that had some of their things in short-term money. Um, the question then was, though, how long would it be till it happened, right? And so that's part of the problem. If you hold the money short term for several years, then although you will earn more money in the future, because we believe that short term yields would be higher in the future than long or than medium term stuff was at present. In other words, there are banks and insurers buying things that were yielding 4% and we believe that short term money would eventually be over 4%. So looking at that, you would just say on average, they're not really getting much from that. And people understood that. I mean, I think it's just what they could invest and in. they had to do it, but they understood that on average, what you've been getting from making loans in some cases, but certainly from buying securities that go out five to 15 years or something is not really all that different than what you used to get at times on short-term money. And now that's what we see. Um, it's gotten to that point. So that's what we do the calculation on. If for that calculation, it's very important that your liabilities be low cost, both in terms of your non-interest expense and also in terms of your interest expense, meaning that you have an ability to keep deposits at your bank or to have uh, for an insurer to have a combined ratio under 100 uh, and to maintain your level of premiums and stuff like that and your level of deposits.
right? So progressive would be one where we'd think that they could generate less than 100 combined ratio and that they could grow premiums over time or it wouldn't fall. Um, and we feel that way about something like frost with deposits. Um, and so, you know, it depends on the bank, but like for frost, for instance, we did feel that their intrinsic values kind of went up over time because they actually did a pretty good job of growing deposits and keeping deposits. And uh, it looks good from that perspective. Um, for some of the other banks that people talk to me about and stuff, it's uh, it's harder to know because some of them are, are making a, more money through lending that really does not depend as much on having the lowest cost of um, their liabilities, their cost of capital, their funding cost. But in general, we've always felt that having extremely low costs of funds is how you make money in um, banking and insurance. Now, Buffett made a lot of money by making very good investments that you know is rare, but that it's hard to make money on the other side. So, you know, and that's the same thing that I would use if I was analyzing something that had commodity stuff. Um, you know, having the lowest cost deposits, having the lowest cost to get things out of the ground and stuff um, would be how we think you'd make money. And then you kind of apply like a normalized look at what that money might be worth. So maybe you say it's three or four percent, maybe you say it's two or four percent, whatever. But it's certainly not zero percent. Mm -hmm. When you think about valuation on a price to deposits, uh, basis, does that account for the banks that have wealth management as a large income stream for their business or does that leave it out? So this is really complicated. So what effectively we would do is treat that as a reduction in the cost of your capital. So this is very confusing, but it, because I feel that's how it actually works at a lot of banks. Now you could say it could be completely different, separate, have no real connection to the bank that they kind of own two units and they don't mm -hmm. help each other out. But basically by getting the trust business for someone, getting asset management stuff, you're using those fees to make it so that that being associated with the deposit business you have, you can then make money on the deposit side. Now the, that's just one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that you make money on the deposit side and you make money on the trust side. Mm -hmm. And that the two have nothing to do with each other, you know, and that you have to analyze them as two separate businesses. In general, I would say that um, asset management businesses inside of banks have often been undervalued relative to standalone asset management businesses. So that is if, if but they're quite small usually, so I don't know how the market would react to them. But in theory, if a bank spun off its asset management business, it probably would have a higher valuation than um, it, it gets inside the bank because it doesn't get as much credit for it inside the bank. Why is that? Because it's true. You see some of these publicly traded asset managers and it seems like they never trade at a premium multiple when the economics of the business are pretty much the same as these other companies that are, I would classify as being a premium, having premium economics. Right. Well, the easy way to look at that is what we talked about with the sure to have higher earnings in five years, 7% mm -hmm. um, growth P of 15, right? So what does that describe? That basically describes the trust part of a bank, mm -hmm. right? Their asset management stuff. If they're, they've are they got sticky customers and stuff like that, like the AUM can go up about 7% without even getting more customers. Um, you know, it depends. Not in a bad market and not in times where there's, you know, no inflation or whatever, but like over, time. over entire decades over time, most people are probably expecting things for their own portfolios. That would mean that if it, if it was at these banks, they'd be growing by like 7%. Here's the thing, the bank's not gonna get a 15 PE with those numbers. So, I mean, recently we saw that a lot with higher growth banks and stuff where they don't get as much credit for being higher growth um, and having higher quality and stuff. And we've talked about that, like they, if you take that return on equity and that um, growth that they had in earnings per share and everything, and you take it to some other kind of business, people mm -hmm. have preferred that other kind of business. I'd say that's been true since, since the financial crisis. In the years from about 2000 to the financial crisis, banks had pretty good PEs on them if they were fast growers and stuff. So I don't think that was true. But I think they've traded at a lower PE versus uh, versus non-banks that share the same financial characteristics. And to me, for something like, say, Frost, that didn't make sense because actually this was a tough environment for them in the last 10 years. Now, for some other banks, it might make sense because, see, if you're borrowing all short and you're lending all long and you're doing 100% of your deposits, you know, and loans and everything, 
um, then actually much of the last 10 years might have been a pretty good period for you. So it might be justified if you're afraid that rates were going to rise or that you just this wouldn't continue to last to believe that those banks should not be given as much credit. Um, the price to book thing I think matters. I actually don't think price to book really matters. I think, like I said, deposits is what I think banks will buy each other on. But I think it matters in terms of the uh, establishing a floor for a company, right? Because at that level, it would make sense that someone else could buy you and uh, even not assuming there's much in the way of synergies and stuff that there would be some, uh, they could get better use out of your deposits than you are, right? So there's, and that's kind of the same way I talk about like liquidation value at car dealers or something at, you know, why I think price to book there matters is because it's mostly made up of cars and um, owned land that they have the dealerships on. And, you know, if someone else can get a good enough return on that, then they'll basically pay you some premium to book. I think if someone else in your area thinks they can get a better return operating your bank, then they'll pay you some premium to your deposits, your core deposits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. So we can uh, go on to something that is currently happening in the market. Like I said in our last podcast of uh, 2022, I wanted we wanted to both just talk about you know more actionable things that are going on. So we could go over Six Flags. We've mentioned it a little bit in different podcasts. Uh, just like the current situation, uh, Jeff was talking about on the podcast, and then I believe I don't know a couple weeks later, uh, an activist campaign uh, came out that is currently going after or trying to work with Six Flags to unlock value. So I thought it'd be fun to spend some time and go slide by slide and really just talk about it out loud as well as give our thoughts. And I can pull it up right here. So we do not hold a position in Six Flags. We are just purely talking about this uh, from the perspective of uh, people that spend a lot of time on this podcast and both uh, in our business, you know, thinking and, and looking at things in entertainment, right? So we could mm -hmm. go in and talk about this. So what's the company called? LNB is the uh, Land and Buildings is the... Uh, company, right? Land and Buildings Investment Management LLC. Have you heard of this uh, fund before? No, I saw with the things that they mentioned before. I don't mm -hmm. believe I am familiar with them. So it seems like they're always like less than five percent. I don't know if they're always less than five percent. It's only that's three why. for this. Yeah. One. So so if they come out um, publicly, mm -hmm. it's their choice to do it. You know. So I would be more familiar if it was something where they're going over five percent usually. Yeah, because they don't even have to file anything. Uh, just to give a little bit of an update before we jump into it, Six Flags currently has a $2.1 billion market cap, $4.3 billion enterprise value, trading about one and a half times sales. Um, and uh, they, let's see, in 2020, sales were down 76% to $357 million. Uh, but in 2021, it was about $1.5 billion. And we could, I believe, get a little bit more updated numbers, but... Uh, the presentation will, I believe, go into it. So Landed Buildings Investment Management LLC is a significant shareholder of Six Flags Entertainment Corp. I don't know why. I always, when I hear significant, I'm thinking like 10, 15, 20%. This sounds so silly because this is so much money, but 3% to me seems like not significant. What are your thoughts on that? I think they usually say significant when they're less than 5%. I think they say to significant it if it's like a 1%. It's like, oh, we own 1%, which, yes, yeah. sure. I mean, 1% of, of $2 billion is a lot of money. I'm not discounting that. But it's just kind of, to me, you're significant. You think, oh, wow, we're a, a very large shareholder. Yes, on a dollar-by-dollar by dollar basis, that's a lot of money. But I don't think that's significant. But maybe I, maybe we're spending too much time in microcap land, Jeff, where you could buy a significant chunk of a company. Mm -hmm. uh, as Let's see. They believe the company is undervalued as the real estate is worth more than the implied equity value of the company based on today's share price. Six Flags new CEO has pursued an aggressive repositioning of the company's parks, which should drive long-term benefits, but adversely impacted attendance in 2022, resulting in recent EBITDA results being depressed. Conversely, Amusement park peers have seen meaningful attendance improvement and recovery of EBITDA to pre-pandemic levels. 
VICI properties, which is publicly traded, VICI, an experiential 50 billion REIT uh, gaming or whatever, has expressed a strong interest in acquiring real estate related to theme parks and has the liquidity and cost of capital to acquire Six Flags real estate at a favorable valuation for Six Flags shareholders. Gaming and leisure properties, which is traded under GLPI, realty income, uh, traded under O, EPR properties, ticker EPR, and Blackstone, as well as numerous private equity funds are likely interested in capable buyers as well. Do you think they reached out to those companies beforehand to sort of gauge some interest? I don't know about that. I mean, they obviously don't have comments from those companies for it. Mm -hmm. um, some, I, Who knows? With some of these, it's just that they cook up an idea by looking at that and they kind of create it internally and stuff and then put out something. Um, but I don't know of anything of any reaction, any statements from any of them saying that we did or didn't talk to them. Mm -hmm. LMB, uh, which is Landed Buildings, recently met with six senior management six flags senior management including ceo salim how do you pronounce his last name basol at the company's headquarters and believes the company will seriously evaluate the monetization of its real estate in whole or in part six flags is working hard to optimize the repositioning put in place in 2022 to drive higher attendance and ebitda in 2023 and lmb is increasingly optimistic about a successful turnaround and then three the dialogue with the company should remain constructive so it's like what's the point here right sounds like everyone's getting along uh land and buildings overview they talk about their fund their investment strategy right what's interesting about that is they say they invest if you go back one we could see one thing that they say which is uh invest in the publicly traded shares of global real estate investment trusts and real estate related companies so they invest in like reits mm -hmm. um, and then you can see what some of those are and some of them may be familiar to people Okay, we can go on. Six Flags overview. So uh, they have the estimated net asset value, midpoint at $42 per share. Stock price is currently $21.37. Uh, uh, upside to net asset value, midpoint, 98%. Um, so lots of upside. Six Flags is the world's largest regional theme park company with $1.5 in annual revenue and 27 amusement parks and water parks across the United States, Mexico, and Canada. The company was founded in the 1960s and following a 2009 bankruptcy, restructured and re-IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange in May of 2010. Six Flags has experienced significant management turnover since its IPO with five CEO changes over the past 12 years. Why is that, Jeff? What is that? Um, that's Well, that's a very good question. I think uh, it was financially over leveraged and operate like an LBO. And we've talked a little bit about that. Um, they don't talk about it here, but basically I don't even think the company really is in exactly the same form, I would say, as it was back then, because as you could see, it was paying out over, uh, you know, with quick FS and stuff, it was paying out over hundred percent of earnings and in, in dividends. And it was uh, taking on, you know, it wasn't lowering debt at all over time. It wasn't really running in a sustainable manner like it was going to um, continue uh, without, like we can see here, um, where is it? Um, well, you can see net issuance of common stock and you can see the dividends, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Under the bottom of the cash flow. Yeah. So if you compare those to like cash flow from operations, which is even before they have CapEx, um, you can see that they're really not retaining a lot um, and that it's being all paid out. And you could also see that in like the payouts and stuff. Um, and so there was uh, basically, you know, run like a... a highly leveraged, you know, like a little LBO type thing. Mm -hmm. Let's see. The current CEO, Salim, was appointed in November 2021 and has overseen a significant strategy shift for the company, focusing on delivering a premium product at a higher price. So a couple of podcasts ago, you sort of gave the 10,000 foot overview on him and the strategy. You had said that it's been a long time, maybe, or I don't know if you've ever seen it, so much insider buying going on by senior management at the company, right? And then also the incentives behind the incentives uh, targets. targets. Yes, the incentives are very high. The ownership and incentives and stuff, the combination of it, if you look at this company, is incredibly high to, in a like three-year time period or something, I'd have to check it, uh, drive an increase in EBITDA to around like 700, it's adjusted EBITDA or something, but like to 700 billion or something. So it's a specific target that they have. 
and um, they're very like short term incentivized that way. He's also a second time CEO. He's at, like the age that you would be retiring or something, and he had been at Middleby for a few decades, I think. Mm. So they brought in someone very highly paid too. And and then he's brought in lots of highly paid people around him and highly incentivized to do something over a period of, you know, three, four years, something like that. More of like an LBO type um, timetable to make improvements in driving up EBITDA. Mm. Six Flags is a real estate rich company owning a significant majority of the land and assets. It operates in major metropolitan areas across North America. Let's see. So we could go down strong brand with national portfolio of irreplaceable theme park assets, strategically located parks. They go over um, their footprint. We could look at that. Um, Six Flags Great Adventure, New Jersey. We've spoken about yeah. them a few times on the podcast. Six yeah, Flags Great America. That's the one that I went to growing up in Illinois. Okay. Yep. And then the one that they're all named after is here, Six Flags mm-hmm. Over Texas. That's what the company took that as their name. So that's mm-hmm. what it's actually from. Um, and then, yeah. And then I was just in San Antonio this year and the, the, the Six Flags Fiesta there, um, and which is uh, by SeaWorld. So mm-hmm. it's also SeaWorld one. Obviously, some of these have other major theme parks right with them, as you can see if you look at what, pla- what places they're located, right? And then some of them are really smaller regional ones, like they have that one, um, what is it? Uh, did they change the name? Frontier City and stuff when they're talking about Oklahoma and all that. Those are some smaller ones, yeah. It's a roll-up of a lot of different... It was a different name of the parks, and it actually rolled up. That Six Flags Over Texas is not what the original operator started out with it just was the most premium property and so they took Mm. that name on and rebranded them to those names but they were other regional theme parks under all different names originally Mm. so the six flags opportunity six flags share price could double six flags is a prime candidate for an opco slash propco separation unlocking six flags real estate through a sale or reit conversion could add 11 dollars per share today given steep valuation discount seems like a lot of these companies when activists come in it seems like they always want to uh convert them to a reit or do something with the real yeah. estate what are your thoughts mm-hmm. generally on that uh I don't know. I mean, this company specializes in stuff, so I don't know that it leaves everybody better overall. Six Flags already has a lot of debt on it, and this would be used to get rid of that, basically, and maybe it would be a lower cost of capital to do it this way um, to replace the debt. So instead, you do that. Um, I mentioned ski things. I was reading another book on on ski resort things, and they actually had several that did REITs um, to do short-term things to basically finance the deal. So basically they leased the um, property that they would otherwise own. They operated all and then Mm. they used the money brought in by that um, lease to uh, by the amount that they got from that basically from. So splitting up the company basically into two parts to take so that they basically didn't have to put in equity and stuff, you know, themselves. So it, it was a way of coming up with the financing for it. You basically don't have to put in money to buy the thing you really want, the operator, because instead you sell off the fact that you own all the land and stuff. Mm. So basically, they do they do a sale and lease back. So they get the capital. They could use that capital to pay down debt, etc. And then they are pay the landlord. Correct. Yeah, basically the same idea. Except you're what you're doing is you're having publicly traded or giving to someone the REIT part of it to get a valuation on it, which could even be higher potentially than what you would get just by doing a sale and lease back. Because which is what they'll argue about in this presentation stuff. Some of these things trade at like higher multiples mm-hmm. and stuff you know yeah. what we're mm-hmm. talking about when they have these very safe sort of tenants and so and they have scale too right so like some of these that are pretty big people can invest in them and everything and often they do put a lot more um i mean basically people you've got the same cash flow people investors tend to put a higher valuation on the guaranteed cash flows from the REIT than they would from what are pretty predictable cash flows from theme parks they don't give them as much credit for that and so it's the same free cash flow stream but you get a higher uh, price on it you know they'll buy it at a lower yield a lower uh, capitalization rate yeah i believe ackman wanted to do that or he did do it or he wanted to do it with mcdonald's he wanted them to spin off their their real estate into a a reit i believe 10 years ago or something like that plus uh how did we get here six flags embarked on ambitious and widely criticized premiumization of its parks in 2022 through price increases and reduced perks which resulted in over 10 million in lost attendance leading to a material share price decline and underperformance to peers. So that was the direct, I mean, that was under the new CEO too, correct? Correct. That's what's happening right now. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the issue that we at, talked about. Six Flags is the largest regional uh, theme park operator in the United States. It is not the most premium. It is not the, the, the brand has the highest awareness. It does not have the highest positioning. Mm-hmm. It is not considered the best parks. Uh, the pricing is not particularly high. I mean, it's complicated, but if you think about it, it, it is easier to go to Six Flags relatively cheaply if you're willing to um, you know, pay just for the gate price and stuff and not do so much of the other thing, you know, depending on how you do, if you buy all the other passes and the food and beverage and everything. But it's possible to get in there at lower prices than other parks might charge. And um, it's probably considered a little less of a family-friendly place, especially in some areas, uh, because of that. And sometimes the location of the parks isn't quite as good. But they're very uh, historically they've been very marketing-driven to drive attendance. So to hit their attendance targets, I think they were over. I mean, look, I'm we'll criticize the previous management and stuff or whatever. But I, my feeling is that for several years they did not invest as much as would normally be invested in the parks and they over invested in, in uh, discounting and stuff to drive attendance numbers while paying out fairly large dividends, presumably because investors and stuff getting the dividends and stuff liked it. And uh, wall street was uh, very focused on attendance, mm-hmm. right? And didn't like to see declining attendance and stuff. So, or, or if you want to just put it hitting their numbers, right. That they just wanted to hit certain guidance numbers or something instead of asking about, you know, whether that's exactly the right way to drive the amount of free cash flow that they would get. Um, you can see from their past results and stuff that, you know, it didn't exactly grow a lot or anything. And that probably, um, uh, you know, it, if you think about inflation and stuff like that, it probably hasn't even kept up with that in terms of the actual average revenue per um, person going there and stuff. It's just not very strong compared to some other parks. Mm-hmm. So when you say investing in their parks, are you talking about bringing in new uh, roller coasters to like drive attendance or what are some different things that they can do to invest in their parks other than maintaining it? Improving food and beverage, um, improving CapEx on some things, definitely improving people moving. Um, they have serious problems in that, I think, versus something like when I talk about Disney and things like that, those are very important. Um, you know, some of that is stuff that was what you get when you buy the park because it's on so much land or on whatever. But then there's a sense of overcrowding at Six Flags at revenue levels for their park that are much lower than what they might be at other parks, you know, and overcrowding is not good um, for the experience for the people there. Uh, it could be too long crowds for um, the time that you end up eating and stuff like that instead of the time that they actually spend being able to go to a lot of rides. So I think they advertised a lot on the rides that they have, but the actual number of rides that people could take once they paid the gate fee, I think was not as high as you might like, because if you sell a bunch of season passes, you have everyone on food and and beverage passes and stuff like that, then you're waiting in lines for very long periods of time. And so a lot of it had to do with that kind of thing. And so I don't know that the satisfaction levels are incredibly high. Um, and I don't know that people would go very far from other places to get there for it. Um, but they, you know, are in a lot of places where they're a very strong park versus, you know, the other choices in the area. And they're, you know, very price competitive. Mm-hmm. So Land and Buildings sees, uh, when we say price competitive, you mean like with alternatives, correct? Because it's not that expensive. Yeah. I mean, like I said, mm-hmm. they have a park. SeaWorld has a park by Six Flags. The parks are very, very close to each other in um, the San Antonio area. I think most people would be more satisfied with the day at SeaWorld than at Six mm-hmm. Flags. Yeah. Um, but I think they would also end up spending a heck of a lot more at SeaWorld, uh, both because of just like the overall things, but also because of how much SeaWorld makes from experiences and things like that and all that. But SeaWorld also has much higher operating expenses for things because it's very expensive to keep, you know, um, Aquarium. Uh, marine mammals and things like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. very expensive. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Land of Building sees two ways to win. Operational turnaround. Six Flags is optimizing its repositioning and pricing strategy, which should lead to a solid attendance recovery in 2023 while maintaining healthy per capita spending uh, and enhanced park experience likely to be welcomed by attendees in 2023. And two, strategic catalysts. Six Flags real estate likely valued at more than equity market cap of $1.8 billion, which can be unlocked with a reconversion or sale. And then multiple capable buyers, including 50 billion experiential re- VICI properties, have interest in acquiring amusement park real estate and have ample capital in today's environment to pursue such transactions. Uh, primary risks, attendance does not rebound. Yes, that would be a huge risk to the company. That would be a huge risk. And monetization of real estate takes longer. Um, 
let's see, current multiple appears to assume permanent impairment to fundamentals. Six Flags stock has been uh, punished, which is definitely true, which we could pull up a quick chart to look at that. We've talked about it a few different times, but we could do that pretty quickly. I believe it's below pre-COVID levels. Uh, yep, okay, so we're like right, basically right there. Um, mm -hmm. It That's has been pretty bad this last year, right? Yeah, and certainly compared to other theme park companies. I mean, the big, the closest comp would be uh, Cedar Fair. There's not a uh, SeaWorld's done. I don't know how the stock has done recently, but certainly mm -hmm. their financial performance has been really a lot better than mm -hmm. than um, Six Flags. Those would be ones that would be obvious comparisons. They're a little bit different though, because like obviously um, Cedar Fair owns a bunch of parks, but some of their parks that are like the earliest ones and stuff are pretty. You know they've invested a lot in them, and and they're strong. Where then they have other parts of the business that are a lot smaller. Sea World is very very few locations, mm -hmm. um, and so those are actually parks that are more. You know we're talking about more individually bordering on like compete somewhere almost closer to competing with like a Disney or something than competing with a, a Six Flags. Um, now overall the entire company they're the similar size. Mm -hmm. Got it. So uh, let's see. New CEO strategy change has depressed near-term EBITDA. Company has sacrificed the tides to the short term to create a better guest experience and a higher margin and more profitable customer base. But ripping the Band-Aid off caused a big miss relative to 2022 expectations. Six Flags multiple is compressed meaningfully, 30% below the historical 10-year average, absent COVID, and sitting at record lows. Six Flags EV to EBITDA multiple of eight times compares to experiential gaming that lease REIT multiples of 15 to 17 times. Every one turn change in EBITDA multiple is 30% upside to equity value. So EV to EBITDA is at all time lows. Um, and estimates have tumbled following strategy shift. Not a good time for Six Flags shareholders. Uh, self-inflicted wounds should subside, allowing shares to recover. While EBITDA is expected to approach 2019 levels, shares are down nearly 70% from prior highs and 50% year to date, uh, which we just talked about. Let's see, uh, Six Flags public theme park peers, SeaWorld and Cedar Fair that performed in line with US equity markets year to date. Revenue and EBITDA for SeaWorld and Cedar Fair is well above pre-COVID levels with attendance near 2019 levels and strong pricing. And even Disney parks did uh, pretty well in 2022. Oh, Disney parks did great. I mean, the yeah. stock did terribly, but the parks are doing well. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Last time I was going to compare it to Cedar or to Disney, but I was like, well, the stock did terrible, but the parks business did, you know, the, recover nicely. <laughs> the Disney domestic parks profitability yeah. is incredible. Um, obviously, they still to this day are not open and earning at the same levels all around the world. But for the domestic ones, yeah, um, the profitability there is really incredibly high. Mm -hmm. Optimism heading into 2023. Do you share this optimism for the theme park industry, Jeff, in 2023? They gave some from Disney, uh, Cedar Fair, no. Comcast, SeaWorld. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think there's some issues here with it. I, I mean, Disney, it, it depends. There's there's things that are good about it and bad. Um, I think, look, it also depends on the company. You know, mm -hmm. Disney is in a different position in terms of employees and stuff than Six Flags. These are not the same employees. They don't have the same um, uh, turnover, right? And they just it's all different in terms of how they're sourcing employees and, and who the employees are and how likely they are to stay there and how much they're going to want higher pay and those sorts of things. So some parks use lots of um, temporary labor, right? So like part-time or seasonal, um, which in a high inflation, high wage type environment could be really, really tough. And that's a big part of your expense. Uh, same thing with when we were talking about SeaWorld stuff. SeaWorld uses some of that, but do you think that you have the same problems with the people who are taking care of the animals? They're not going to switch to doing a completely different job that way, but most of the employees at Six Flags are are extremely, uh, you're extremely vulnerable to labor pricing issues and stuff. So uh, I think, yeah, they're more exposed to that. They're more comparable to Cedar Fair, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so far, do you like what you've seen in this presentation? I mean, it's what I expect to see, right? This is, we see this all the time with the, to do this. And uh, it's not wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, they mentioned the Marriott, um, right? And, and I think, you know, that gets talked about in, um, uh, the, the Marriott did some financial engineering stuff over time. Um, 
Yeah. I was mean, that the, the one cash flows are stock market fair. genius. Yeah, that that was in stock market genius, and they did even more after that too. Yeah, but um, that it, yeah, when they say in the 1990s, that part they're talking about it was in you can be a stock market genius. Um, they're not wrong about that. I mean, look, the cash flows on Cedar Fair, which is an MLP, you know, that pays it out mm-hmm. and stuff. So it's basically similar to being a, a REIT and stuff. Uh, and what you can get in terms of yields on that compared to what people will accept in yields on much dodgier REITs is a big difference, um, you know? So, you know, they tend to be valued at reasonable prices. Not always, um, but I'd say now they are. They're valued at very reasonable prices when you think about how predictable their cash flows are and everything. Um, you know, very, very reasonable. And you can collect that cash flow and something like Cedar Fair gets paid out to you and the other ones, yeah, who knows what they're going to do with it. But, you know, none of them really just like go crazy for growth and acquisitions and stuff right now. So you're going to get the money as a buyback or paid out to you or to pay down debt or something. I don't see any of these companies as like, no one's opening new parks. No one's opening new parks in the United States. And like, you know, I mean, really um, of the kinds that we're talking about here, just this industry hasn't been in an expansion mode for, you know, certainly at least, 25 years with the last big parks that were done but for a lot of it, it's more like 40 years in most of these markets and um so yeah they're all free cash flow cows mm-hmm. um and the yields on them are much higher but you know the yields on lots of high free cash flow stocks are often higher than they are on REITs and stuff you know yeah i skipped ahead just so i could uh, validate your point about supply so they have a slide on page 34 no new supply supply protected industry there's virtually no new construction of regional theme parks in the united states providing a moat around the business the last major regional theme park to be built in the u.s was a hard rock park aka freestyle music park a music themed amusement park in myrtle beach south carolina that opened in 2008 and was closed permanently in 2009 amid the financial crisis yikes jeff that sucks. Well, these things do fail. Hard Rock also, I think they had a casino that was an issue in 2009 too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons that they fail is because they do this financial engineering stuff that we're talking about doing right here. <laughs> yeah. I uh-huh. mean, you know, um, I mean, part of the reason, right, if you're looking at Six Flags or if you're looking at Cinemark or any of these things, right, like, but let's say Six Flags because we're looking at here, we said the enterprise value and the, the market cap. The enterprise value has on it the debt. If this company didn't have debt, then obviously it would be in a different position in terms of investing in the parks and everything. Mm -hmm. And the investments in the parks historically for the industry have been pretty good. So putting a dollar in um, has generally had returns that are on the, you know, borderline between uh, very high single digits and very low double digits. So applying a little bit of debt to that, two thirds equity, one third debt or something, a more reasonable number than doing, you know, re conversions and doing what Six Flags has in terms of its debt and everything, um, get you stock market beating returns. So like a dollar retained can often get you stock market beating returns. Now you can't retain that much because like they're not growing, the market isn't really growing. So they're not, you know, in the early days they were all retained a lot and grew a lot and they borrowed a lot. But um, but today, what they do retain often, I would say, has at least a dollar value. And in today's stock market has more than a dollar value. Like it's, you know, what they choose to use in CapEx and stuff probably is worth a bit more than what they uh, pay out to you in a dividend, you know? Mm-hmm. How would you think about theme parks as it relates to barriers to exit, right? So that's the <laughs> yeah. problem with some of these companies, yeah. right? And that's We've also used... the problem with this real estate. Yeah, uh-huh. that's the, this real estate has no other use. Yeah. Like we've talked a lot about like um, cruise lines, right? So a company's going to spend whatever they spend, billion dollars on a cruise ship. It'll do right. you know a 4% free cash flow return, generate 40 million in cash. Right. And then it's like, oh, we'll just keep it running because, well, it's not losing money. It's still, you know, 4%, but clearly that was the wrong capital allocation decision. So how do you think right. about barriers? Because again, like what the hell are you going to do with a billion dollar They're... cruise ship? <laughs> Yeah. So, well, you can sell it to other countries and they do. So at the end of their life, it gets sold to another country. So, you know, Carnival or Royal Caribbean or whatever might um, buy a ship that could last 30 to 40 years. They'll only operate it for 20 and then they'll sell it to someone in India or wherever who might have some other use for it for the last 10 to 20 years. um, And they eventually dispose of it. Um, But they uh, can be repositioned and, you know, you can, so you can move them into different markets that would make more sense. You can't do that with something like this. 
Um, we know that in some cases, Six Flags shut down parks and the parks are empty. The parks are abandoned. I mean, Six Flags has a history where it's lost some parks before because of that. And so that's, you know, um, yeah. Some of your real estate could end up being uh, useless, obviously, in this kind of case. Yeah. Now, if you reinvest in them and stuff, they're usually fine. But if you make some operating mistakes with them, um, it is possible to have uh, parks that are not worth operating because the operating expense is so high. It's a huge, huge number that you have to get over that break even. So if, if this is, say this company has supposedly has like, I don't know what it is last year, but generally you'd have about 90% operating margin, uh, 90% gross margin, about 30% operating margin, meaning you have about 60% um, operating expense relative to uh, sales. Okay, so what that means is that some of these parks are a lot better than others, but a lot of them are only at, let's say, 1.5 times or something level that you would need before you would run into the break-even point. So the margin of safety is only that if you had a reduction in your revenue of like uh, 35% or something, then you'd, you'd actually be cash flow negative at that point. Like, you know, once you factor in that you have to make reinvestment and everything, you're, it would be a cash burn, basically. And so usually that's a problem with a park that's being opened and hasn't reached that level yet. But in some cases, it can be if you increase the operating expense or some other factors come in, it could be that you could drop below that number and then it becomes, you know, worthless in that sense. And then we get a better reputation, whatever. No one would want to buy the park with the things there. And after there's a few years where it's closed down, everything's in disrepair and no one wants it and stuff. So, um, yeah, part of it is you have to continue to operate the properties that way. I mean, look, if you did a REIT for casinos in Vegas... It probably worked out well. If you did a REIT for casinos in Atlantic City, you probably lost everything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, because half of them or whatever would just be, people wouldn't even want the properties. So it depends. But um, I think it's, I mean, I would rather have a REIT of consisting of theme parks, I guess, than a REIT consisting of casinos. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then they walk through some different valuations. Six like some of the parts suggest a potential double by 2024. Any operational upside can significantly enhance return potential. And I'm going to put this presentation in the description so anybody could view it for themselves. But of course, you could also Google to find it. Uh, MGM Resorts is an owner and operator of integrated casino resorts, including lodging, retail, and entertainment facilities located primarily in Las Vegas and Macau. And mm -hmm. they talk about... Um, their history of uh, the conversion with REIT and the significant value that it created. They are using MGM as an example, right? Case study. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, VICI is an experiential REIT that owns a large portfolio of gaming, hospitality, and entertainment destinations, including Caesars Palace and the Venetian Resorts in Las Vegas. Uh, VICI is well positioned to buy all or part of Six Flags real estate given an attractive cost of capital explicitly interested in buying theme park real estate including assets like six flags owns uh, 50 billion enterprise value makes a six flags transaction highly attractive small enough to execute in a difficult capital markets environment but still big enough to move the needle okay so they're brokering a deal or making a case for it and they are going off yeah, of public things that uh, they have set on conference calls, uh, like the yeah, VICI. We love the indoor water parks, the yeah. theme park business, family entertainment centers. So family entertainment centers would be like Dave and Buster's. They just did their merger with the main event. So they're basically the one that's left in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Private and public comps for gaming real estate highlight embedded value in Six Flags. They go over recent private transaction comps. This is basically like an investor, wow. investment banker uh, presentation. There was here. one. So <laughs> there was one done in December of this year. MGM at, Grand. 18 times multiple. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, huh? So that says 2022. So that's just now that they did this. So that's with interest rates where they are and everything. Is that an EBITDA? It's got to be an EBITDA multiple if that's all they're using here. And that's obviously the, the metric everybody uses in theme parks. Wow. Yeah. What else? That's weird because, yeah, that is, I got to look up that property. That seems pretty high. Now, half of the ones in here are from basically three acquirers or something mm -hmm. like that. Like almost, almost everything that they're, they have the same. Yeah. It's basically the same one. So, which is the ones they mentioned. 
um, so they're the same acquirers. But that's impressive because they're using things from 2021 and 2022. And I would have said, yeah, I mean, the, just these deals throughout the 2010s and stuff would be one thing, but now you wouldn't think there is a great deal of appetite for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, let's go on. How we got here? Okay, repositioning of parks was too aggressive. Let's just uh, take a few shots at the CEO. New Six Flags CEO, Salim, I'm not going to try his last name, hit a hard reset in 2022 in order to materially enhance the guest experience and create a more profitable, higher margin business, migrating Six Flags to a more affluent, family-oriented customer base. I don't know if that's exactly true because I've been to a Six Flags. I went to a Six Flags in mm -hmm. 2022 and I did not get that overall feeling. I, I was with you well, that like as like moving yeah. crowds and stuff like that. I mean, it was... Now it was Fright Fest, obviously, and this is you know one weekend, okay. but it was and, so and they wanted to busy, yeah, and they and they did play up those things a bit, I think. So I think they wanted to focus more on um, doing more with like Fright Fest and stuff, and less the discounting, you know, with this season ticket. I mean, here's the thing, which we know, and a lot of people who have been to Six Flags know people who go there and stuff. Basically, what the company did for a long time is kind of say to you, well, in fact, they did monthly charging for this, so they would sell you a a season pass where they would let you pay monthly, but they lock you in, you know? So it would be like having a cable bill that way. So it would be some very small number that way. Um, but that, and then paying up front for a season pass, basically what they would tell you is, look, the season pass it pays for itself in two visits or something, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. It's not like how Disney priced their season passes or whatever. So what we're talking about is they want to get a lot of it up front. Um, and then you would have people go who could do it on a, a low uh, cost that way. So, for instance, with what they're talking about with the affluent family-oriented customer base, right? Uh, and they'd have things like, you know, bring a friend and whatever, stuff like that. So, like, someone who's in the area there could certainly um, pay for a season pass and then try to have a very cheap day of it each time they go and yet go a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And so that attracts a different kind of customer potentially. Uh, that's someone who's not going to spend a lot on the other things. And then they even did things with, like, all basically like all you can eat type stuff and whatever, you know, like you can eat every few hours and, and sell those kinds of passes too. a lot of this trying to get high. Um, I think the problem with it is that it can charging that way is that it can increase um, usage and wastage um, of things higher than you want it to be um, instead of controlling it better. So, uh, for instance, um, the food thing's really bad doing that, for instance. But um, instead of trying to get higher uh, things for people who pay at, for complimentary things as they go, so for things that add on to the overall cost that you have, right? And, um, and then also maybe there's some things with if you don't have a high enough gate price in some areas that might be difficult because it, you could have some problems, I guess. Um, and I don't know if they've had any of those, but certainly theme parks had those problems in like the seventies and stuff. So as things got a little more difficult in terms of crime and things in some areas, some of the reasons why some parks closed and stuff is for that very reason. They ended up located in the wrong areas um, because they've been originally meant for um, people using mass transit or whatever. And then um, it wasn't as attractive to suburban uh, um guests right which is what the whole industry is built on now it doesn't really serve urban areas at all it's all built around the suburban stuff and that really all changed when you built disneyland and disney world and stuff but um so go ahead with the uh criticism of the ceo <laughs> <laughs> attendance plunged the seo execute on, on a premiumization strategy at six flags raising prices and significantly reducing discounting slash perks current theme park pier uh Cedar Fair and SeaWorld results around pre-COVID levels clearly illustrate Six Flags attendance decline was largely self-inflicted. The seasonal nature of the business and short park season left little room for the tri for trial and error and to pivot this year. Uh, mistakes were clearly made in 2022, but we see no evidence of permanent impairment to parks. Right. We should point out one thing there to make this understand for you understanding the stock. It mentions the year-to-date attendance, but it also mentions the increase in the per capita. So it's, it's important to understand both of those, because if they only had the attendance decline without the per capita, the company would really not be making money, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you see there, you can see that how much was per capita spending up? It says, however, guest spending per capita was up more than 50% versus pre-pandemic levels to $60.96 in uh, Q3 2022, which is really good. <laughs> really good. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, that, that is very good. And also shows you how low it was. Cause think about that. That is only competitive with like some, uh, other regional parks and things that, that are not public traded and whatever, but like, that's what it's in line with after the 50% increase, Mm -hmm. you know, the guests, the spending per guest is really pretty low. Yeah. Um, and was very low before this. Yeah. Um, and then there's a quote from the current CEO of Six Flags it says in 1994 season passes to Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey, average $75. Fast forward 25 years to 2019 and we were still charging an average of only $75 for our season pass, despite the fact that we have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in our parks. Is that surprising yeah. to you? I mean, I've been to that park. That was a thing that kind of went bad for them in terms of like rules change and stuff about the animal attraction that they could have there in New Jersey and they changed things and stuff. But that park was at one time, one of the most popular parks in America and stuff. And outside of like Disney and those things, it would have been an incredibly successful park. And it was advertising big time when I was a kid, which is what he's talking about there. And yeah, that was the big attraction. Definitely. Um, that's a special park that they have though. Their others are not nearly as good. They're not on as much land, not in as good a position as that. And they had a huge animal attraction there. Um, and they do still have it, but it's basically just part of the same ticket price for it. And it doesn't, I don't think attract as many people as it used to. You can't mm-hmm. drive through it yourself. So you have to go on like a, a sort of, um, tram Tour. thing that they operate and yeah. And they, drop you off to try to get you to spend some money and stuff uh, midway through, but it's sort of a commitment that's kind of now separated too much from the rides and stuff. So it's almost like it's like operating a water park slash theme park, which a lot of these things do. It's not integrated into it the way that it is in like animal kingdom or something, but yeah, it's a, that's a terrific property that they have and the great thing that they had there and, and obviously had a lot of goodwill in the, in New Jersey and stuff um, and a ton of advertising and stuff that supported that. None of it based on price. Mm-hmm. all based on the experience and the animals and all that when I was a kid when he's talking about it. So they start to talk about uh, the uh, resume of Six Flags CEO and his experience at Middleby. They say he deserves the benefit of the doubt at Six Flags. Was a celebrated CEO due to his outstanding results at Middleby Corporation, ticker MIDD, a global leader in food service equipment. Middleby returned over 12,000% during his 18-year tenure, with the market cap growing from $40 million to nearly $7 billion. Salim grew revenue from just $100 million when he took the helm to nearly $3 billion upon his retirement in 2019. So pretty crazy. Yep. And that company sold, you know, like sold uh, equipment to Domino's and things like that. It's food service uh, um, uh, stuff, you know, to those kinds of, those would be those kinds of customers and stuff, food service equipment, like they said. So, yeah, pretty good was, results. Yeah, and that was an amazing result. And that's like a roll-up type thing um, as well as other things, but they became huge in that industry. Mm-hmm. Looking forward to a better 2023. Okay, let's see. Low expectations for 2023 earnings. Path to meet or exceed investor expectations. Six Flags has clear opportunities to improve results on both revenue and expenses. Six Flags analysts appear to far too conservative on 2023 attendance and EBITDA estimates given sharp hits to revenue and margins in 2022 from the repositioning program, assuming only mid single digit revenue growth in 2023, multiple revenue growth levers to drive outsized growth in 2023. And they go over a bunch of those six flags likely to continue to control and cut costs. So they're making a good investment case for where we currently are. Uh, Basically the company doing well, in an environment where they currently have low expectations. Um, Yeah, what's interesting about this slide is if you really read it, um, basically they're saying they're going to, this is not from the company, this is from Landon Buildings, the activist investor. So what they're saying is basically they're too conservative on attendance and EBITDA estimates because the company will reverse itself on everything, right? So like they didn't market, they will market this time. They didn't cut staff enough, they will cut staff enough this time. They didn't focus enough on the passes, they will focus on that. Basically, they'll go back to what they were doing before, right? That seems to be what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So the CEO said that we left money on the table. For example, our staffing levels were not optimized given the reduced attendance in the first half. Uh, let's see, another quote, the sustained improvements we are seeing in guest satisfaction and spending per capita and our improved October results give me confidence we are moving in the right direction. He's quite an optimistic 
person on the tra- on the uh, earnings calls. You know, uh-huh. um, lots of detail, lots of anecdotes and whatever, but certainly a very um, uh, optimistic about the business and the things that they can do and all that. Um, you know, that kind of leader. Um, not so much like saying that our stock is cheap, you know, whatever things, but like talking about what they're going to improve and all the things they can improve and all of that. Yeah. How much stock is he buying in the open market? It's very complicated. You have to read the proxy to understand like the, the amounts that they have to buy. They have like uh, amounts that target amounts that they're supposed to own and all of that. But yeah, I believe if you looked in one of the things like, um, that tracks insider purchases would be a good one. Does Data Roma do it? Data Roma does it. Yeah. You could do that one. Um, they do, uh, like you'll see all the insider purchases and it'll show up as a lot of them. Yeah. There's certainly a lot of incentives and a lot of stock and everything, um, that they've bought over time and all the, um, yeah. So if you, do, they have an insider tab there. Yeah. Um, if you go to, yeah, it shows open market insider buys. Yep. The CFO so, is buying a lot. Uh, right. President and CEO, obviously. Yeah, lots of, I mean, it looks like, I mean, a ton throughout uh, November. Yeah, and, and some of them are small purchases, but some of them are very large purchases or, you know, lo- relatively large purchases that you'd see there. Um, so there's they're constantly buying and stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you also just have to read the incentives, I would say, because it's very targeted to this adjusted EBITDA idea within a certain number of years and all that. It's very, very specific that way. It says total insider buys slash sells over the last six months, zero sellers, but uh, 49 buyers of about $91 million over the last six months. But I believe that if you get bumped off, the company and then you sell it doesn't capture that Mm -hmm. so if you bring in a whole new management team that buys stock and the old management team you know sells all their stock whatever we wouldn't capture that fact Mm -hmm. yeah so it is new people being brought in because he brought in new people around him Mm -hmm. okay a better guest experience higher guest satisfaction critical to six flags success that is certainly true they are in the entertainment business uh the six flags a park experience is getting better and should be rewarded over time um, and then improvements to Six Flags parks should be clearly visible next year as CapEx is spent on high return investment projects and new technology is levered to directly enhance the guest experience. Yeah, and, and that's basically all the things he says in the earnings call. They're just copying down all the stuff that he said that they're doing, you know. Got it. Uh, let's see. New events scheduled to drive attendance. Events can drive repeat visits and higher in-park spending. The first year of some event usually isn't that big, though. You know, like you were saying, Fright Fest or whatever, that's something they've been doing forever and they do it at a park for a long time and they improve it and stuff. Then they get big business that way. But, you know, I don't think you usually make money on the first time you do a totally new one. I think that it's in the later years when you repeat it at the same location that you make it because it costs money to do it. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Balance sheet catalyst forthcoming. Real estate sales can fast track path to buybacks and dividends, which we spoke about earlier. A monetization of Six Flags real estate would be a positive balance sheet catalyst that can turn the stock back into a return on capital story. And they're advocating for a share buyback. As the balance sheet is fortified, Six Flags can begin buying back stock if the share price remains depressed. Dividend reinstatement on the horizon. Six Flags eliminated its dividend at the beginning of the pandemic in April 2020 to conserve cash. In Q4 2019, Six Flags paid an 83 cent quarterly dividend. $3.32 $3.32 annualized, equal to a 16% dividend yield at the current share price. Reinstating a sustainable dividend will come into focus as leverage declines. So we've spoken about a few companies that you feel like as soon as they reinstate their dividend, if they do, then these stocks sort of tend to trade more in line with their dividend yields. Yes. But if we look at their quick FS thing for them, um, in terms of their dividend and what they're paying and everything on that, I think that... Um, we'll see a problem there, uh, which is that, um, oops, one second. Okay. And we're good. Six flags. All right. Oops. Six flags. There you go. Okay. What do you want to go? Cash okay. flow so statement? let's go to cash flow statement. Yeah. So what did they pay out in dividends in 2019? 279 million. 
Okay. And then cash flow from operations was negative in 2020, and it was what in 2021? 335 million. Okay. And it trailing 12 months is what? 223 million. Right. So if we subtract certainly CapEx from cash flow from operations, they'd be paying out more dividends than they have in free cash flow if they reinstated the dividend at this point. And actually, they're pretty close to they'd be paying all of their cash flow from operations. Mm -hmm. The situation was that they had over 400, they were between 400 and 500 million in cash flow from operations for um, all years from 2015 through 2019, basically. Yeah. And basically, they're at the same level in 2014, too. So, um, I'd say that they were running in the 400 to $500 million range for like six years in a row. And then a hundred to 150 million in CapEx, uh, they were basically paying everything out in that dividend. So yeah, it is like a, you know, it'd be like a 15% dividend yield or whatever, but it's like a 15% free cash flow yield. I mean, that's why, because it, they'd be paying out all their free cash flow, you know, if they got back to that level. I mean, basically the company was doing, we would say about, depending on how you define it, eh, I, I would say they were around 300 million in free cash flow is what they were doing consistently before the the um, pandemic. That's probably right. Mm. Though I don't think they, like, on like Cinemark, I don't think they were pushing themselves in terms of having particularly high cap X at that time. So I think that's kind of peak um, free cash flow that they had. But if we look at the company today, the market cap is what, two what do we say? 2.1 billion. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. 2.1. Yeah. So if you have 2.1 billion dollar market cap and you have a um, you know, 300 million plus free cash flow previously, then you are trading at it's not far from just 15% free cash flow yield, you know, leverage with the debt that you have now. So just if they got back to what they had before, you'd be getting close to 15% free cash flow on your your equity. Um, but of course, half of, you know, there's another 2 billion or so in debt. Mm -hmm. Is that the figure you would use though? Just, I mean, if we're going to make the case for Six Flags not putting as much as they should have back into the parks, I mean, is that a normalized figure you think going forward? How would you, would I mean, you discount it a little bit? No, I mean, I, I mean, there's been inflation and stuff. I think definitely that you could achieve those numbers again if you got back to that level. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have the same market share, the same whatever, yeah, you should get back to those levels they had before. I don't know if it's as cheap to operate the parks because, you know, labor is a ma major component sure. of the costs and stuff. But yeah. Um, but it's the same thing we said with like Cinemark or whatever. That's if they get back to the numbers they had before, right? We don't know if they will. Um, so this is uh, that insiders are buying the stock, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, it says insider transactions underscore confidence in companies potential. So we uh, went over that. No new supply, right? One of the good things about the theme park industry is mm -hmm. that uh, with no new supply, growing revenues go to existing operators. Why do you think that yeah. is? Is it because it's just so expensive to start one or what is it? Well, I think there's a variety of issues there. Um, one, it is expensive to start them. So that's one issue. Putting together the really big parks and stuff that could make a lot of money for you, I think it's harder to do that now than it used to be. Um, and then I also think that um, a lot of them are operated by companies that want them for their cash flow and stuff over time. You know, that's what it ended up being in the hands of. Um, and so that has a major factor too. You know, Six Flags bought out a lot of these things, right? Like mm -hmm. if if you hadn't rolled them up, might some of these operators, if they've been successful, try to open something else up, you know? Mm -hmm. Like these smaller operators and stuff tried things. Um, so... And then, you know, sometimes it's just unique ideas. A lot of the early ones that were successful were unique ideas. Disney was a unique idea. SeaWorld was a unique idea. They were doing something different. Um, so anytime there's a different idea to have a park built around a totally different experience than you had before, that might bring interest into the into the market, right? Mm -hmm. uh, theme parks are steady growers and historically resilient. Six Flags and its closest Pier Cedar Fair have consistently generated mid single digit revenue growth in normalized environments. Six Flags revenues declined 11% in 2009 with Cedar Fair experiencing a similar decline and recovered quickly. Mm -hmm. They have an article from Variety why theme parks are proving recession proof. No such mm -hmm. thing as recession in Disneyland. I mean, but is that the yeah. same for Disney, would you say? I mean, we've spoken a lot about Disney is like a huge, um, you know, expense for a family, right? It's a destination thing which is different than Cedar Fair or Six Flags. 
Yes, I think they're different customers. I think that they're drawing locally to ones that are more sensitive to other things. Yeah. I mean, one thing that you have that benefits you too is if you have a recession, a lot of times in the US, you know, um, you've also had big declines in gas prices, you know, and so mm -hmm. you're traveling to some place that it doesn't, I don't think it has a huge effect, but I think it has some negative effect when you have high gas prices because everyone who goes to the parks obviously drives to the parks. So they think about that. And uh, I think objectively it's not a very big expense but i think because it's the something that they think of it's something that people will bring up and say that they don't um uh that they cost more and stuff like that so conclusion they bring it all home an opportunity to unlock substantial real estate value landed buildings is a significant shareholder three percent of six flags and believes the company's material undervalued as the real estate is worth more than the implied equity value of the company based on today's share price Six Flags' new CEO has pursued an aggressive repositioning of the company's parks, which should drive long-term benefits, but adversely impacted attendance in 2022, resulting in recent EBITDA results being depressed. Conversely, amusement park peers have seen meaningful attendance improvement and recovery of EBITDA to pre-pandemic levels. VICI Properties, ticker VICI, experiential $50 billion REIT has expressed a strong interest in acquiring real estate related to theme parks and has the liquidity and cost of capital to acquire Six Flags real estate. Then they go over the other companies. Landon Billings recently met with Six Flags senior management. The six keeps throwing me off because so I want to say like six senior management numbers. That's why I would say Six Flags. Yeah. LMB recently met with Six Flags senior management, including CEO Salim at the company's headquarters and beliefs. The company will seriously evaluate the monetization of its real estate in whole or in part. Six Flags is working hard to optimize the repositioning put in place in 2022 to drive higher attendance and EBITDA in 2023. And Land and Buildings is increasingly optimistic about a successful turnaround. The dialogue with the company should remain constructive. So, I mean... It, was this an activist campaign? Was this, I mean, kind of just like, uh, here are some ideas that we have that we want to communicate to the markets. I mean, it sounds like, you know, everyone's kind of on the same page here, it sounds like. But there's also well, some things that they could one. do. Yeah, I know. That's right. true. We've only heard from one. Um, so let's look at the stock chart, right? Yeah. Get an idea of what happened here if this came out and um, what was going on with the stock before that. Alrighty, so we go to OTCM, type in S I X, and we can yeah, look we at it. Do like six months or one year, yeah. Sure, we'll go one year. Alrighty. So not a big reaction that's been sustained in the stock at all, right? No. So I what when did this come out? Like end of December, middle of December, we'll call it like the twenty two buck area. And we currently sit around. Yeah. I mean, I think the CNBC story, does the CNBC story tell you what it was? It was a mover on the day at first for when I think it was released. I believe it showed up. Um, oh, well, there's, I think there might be another article on CNBC or something about the day when it was released. Uh, like CNBC wrote an article about it and stuff. So it did um, talk about it. And it was like an active stock that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But obviously it's not very different from when they, um, wrote up the company and it's at pretty low prices for the year and everything. And it was really in the, uh, what was it? Basically when their season was starting that it's the stock started to perform really badly. Right. So like May or something, you know, around that time. Um, and then through the period when they actually could get attendance numbers and all that. So basically a lot of their operating season, cause these are pretty seasonal. Um, you know, the results being bad was probably what was hurting the stock. What are your thoughts on, uh the presentation and six flags in general. Um, I don't know. I think the, like I said, they've, they've done things with ski resort things. They've done things with casinos, you know, uh, n not them landed buildings, but, um, there have been REIT things. Um, apparently REITs have acquired some things even very recently, which I did not know they were doing. Um, so, uh, you know, Doing that and trying to carry out their strategy seems like two completely opposite ideas that would run into conflict with each other because the burden that you're going to put on the company, of it's basically paying rent now, um, it doesn't have a huge amount to cover those fixed charges as it's trying to do this. And so that potentially to me is part of the problem. Um, so I think it... You know, if you're someone who's like visiting the parks and stuff, you'd rather they not do this because it obviously threatens some things that way. Like um, if you're a stockholder, maybe you like it. I don't know. 
Um, if they could, you know, it, it could be a lot of money that they could do from it, mm-hmm. um, raise from it. But, you know, it's not like the company's debt free. So it's not like they haven't been already having that issue of being leveraged up. Um, you're already getting leverage type returns in the stock that way. So, yeah, obviously doing it and buying back your stock or whatever, sure, that would make it much more likely that you have really good returns if you hit the kinds of goals that they have. Um, so that's true. And yeah, it's true that the market isn't valuing them that, uh, well on their, their numbers before. Right. So like if you had the REIT, they still, let's say you had to come up with 200 million in cash flow from operations every year, um, to cover, you know, what you're gonna have to pay on this or whatever. I'm just making the number up cause they covered 200 million. So outside of COVID, you're hitting that number no matter what, right? Mm-hmm. So like if it falls from 400 to 250, you still cover it. It doesn't necessarily look that scary if you're covering um, 1.3 times or something in like the worst year they've ever had or something, you know? So if you just care about collecting the um, payments uh, for, you know, as a REIT, then I guess that's why they would value it so highly, right? Mm-hmm. Um I don't know that I would be more interested in owning a REIT than owning the stock though, because you know, the upside potential that you get from the stock is pretty big. Um, so is it a safe free cash flow yield though? Is it a safe 15% free cash flow yield? Um, I mean, no, it hasn't gotten back to what it was at before Mm -hmm. certainly, and it may not get back there. Um, it is, I mean, even when we take this most recent, so, I mean, they still generated what a hundred, I mean, a trailing 12 month basis, they generate a hundred million in free cash flow or something like that. Mm-hmm. So the entire stock is, you know, it's just trading at like 40 times on a, uh, EV to free cash flow basis with debt and like 20 times, um, uh, on just the equity. So, yeah, I mean, look, this is true with any of these things that have so much operational leverage. If you just take a bad year and say it keeps getting worse or something, they all go to zero on that basis. You know, but you could do that with any restaurant. You could do that with any whatever that has that where, you know, if you're existing on um, the fact that, you know, the free cash flow can decline quite a lot that way. I think it's more predictable probably than something like Cinemark um, in terms of the market coming back. On the other hand, it could be pretty dangerous as a stock from an operational perspective because you could definitely mess things up a lot with the changes that you're going to make. Although you could also make positive changes, but you know, um, when you're changing things like the passes and all of that and the pricing and uh, those things, uh, that can be really big and disruptive changes that could surprise people, um, in terms of how bad it goes for the company. And it surprised them how bad it went this year. The other thing though, is that I think maybe not all of this is related to six flags as a business in terms of the poor stock performance, because while the business numbers have been coming in bad, It's also that it could be really exposed to things people don't want to be invested in next year, right? So like this year, I should say. So um, you have a bunch of debt. You don't like higher interest rates, right? Um, You don't like uh, difficulty in getting labor, right? You don't like a slowing economy that people in are not going to want to go to the theme park, to the um, amusement parks here as much. Um, So... I think all those are potential problems. And we talk about comparisons with inflation and all that. So like 69 to 81 and stuff, that's a bad period for theme parks. It's a bad period for those kinds of businesses actually. Um, because they, some of them went under and stuff because labor is important. Uh, consumer confidence to some extent is important. Uh, your guest experience and, um, uh, your, uh, um, financing it, you know, Usually these are financed with a lot of debt. Certainly the weaker ones and stuff are always financed with a lot of debt. So that's tough. Financing costs are up. Labor costs are up. People less likely to want to go to your park because maybe they're not as confident in everything. And, um, you know, those all are things that could be happening or things that people might fear are happening right now in the United States, right? So if they fear that rates will be pretty high for a while and inflation, you know, labor costs, are pretty high and you have, you know, stagflation basically is what I'm talking about. That's not good for a theme park. I'm trying to see if it's six flags respond to this. Uh, I don't see an 8k that, uh, was uploaded to sec.gov, but I was curious if they added any commentary, maybe they said something to CNBC or something in response to maybe, this presentation. Yeah. Maybe someone will add, no, I don't didn't see anything where the company responded. Um, maybe someone will ask them in the next earnings call or whatever about it, but um besides that i don't expect it 
them to respond. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you four questions in closing on this uh, okay. podcast and topic. If you were running a 20 stock portfolio, would you own Six Flags? Yes or no? Uh, right now, no. Really? Well, that kind of messes up the rest of my questions because I was going to say, if you were running a 15 stock portfolio, would you buy Six Flags? No? No, I'm a no on it. And 10 and because... 5. So it's literally a no yeah. for you. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's a no. Um, It's a no because of the management and their strategy. I don't know that I know enough about it and what they're going to do. And I don't know that there could be problems um, that could get really bad. Um, they could do things that are very positive with it, but all, all these things, you know, whenever people talk about turnarounds or things they're going to do, it's always talking about the positive things that are going to happen there. It's never talking about the negative things that could happen from doing that. Right. Um, I think some of the strategy could make sense, but I don't know. Uh, the CEO has no experience in this kind of business at all. Um, and I don't know that the things that he did at Middleby to transfer all that well to this. Um, so that's another issue. And then just hearing him talk and everything, um, you know, the, the transcripts and all that, um, I feel mixed about it. Mixed um, because he cares more about the stock instead of like the operations of the business? No, or... no, no. Oh, no. He cares more about the operations. Yeah. Okay. No, he doesn't. It's not like he's talking about the stock and stuff that way. He's talking about the customer experience and all of those sorts of things. But um, mixed. I mean, have you read any of the transcripts? Just some of the ones that we've spoken about off the podcast and that we've you sent to me. Yeah. I think he and other people there are probably enthusiastically believing that they can carry out something that will be successful. Mm -hmm. And they're aiming to do it. And if they succeed... Um, to hit the like EBITDA type targets, which they didn't withdraw last I heard. Um, for you know a couple of years from now, now maybe they're I don't remember if they're really twenty twenty five targets, twenty twenty six, but they're basically those kind of targets. Um, then the, it'll be worth a lot. Like I mean, if you take what those targets are, even if they don't produce free cash flow between now and then, you take what those targets are, and you say when they p hope to hit them, you apply what's a normal EBITDA multiple. They're a little bit less than normally even on multiple, maybe 10 times is more likely um, to the stock. Then even without generating free cash flow and stuff, you're talking about something where the stock would be up, you know, 150% or something. Plus, of course, you have the free cash flow in the years in between. There will be some free cash flow. So, um, you know, because basically you're talking about almost a doubling in the value of the company and a lot of it is debt. So it all goes to the benefit of the stock. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the other thing is you could, of course, this is a very, very, very liquid company in terms of the, the I mean, the stock, uh, it's incredibly high volume of stuff. So you could always, you know, when people ask about leaps and stuff, this is the kind of thing where if you're going to do leaps, I would do it that was my next because, question. yeah, because the outcome will either be they succeed or give up, you know? Or it's disastrous results and stuff too, in terms of how much they're trying to change. I, I wouldn't normally invest in a business in which they're trying to change so much as they're trying to change. I mean, you have totally new people and they're trying a totally different strategy. That's not normally something I invest in. So, you know, um, you know, it, I mean, if a Disney Park said, okay, we really want to um, lower how much people are spending each time and oh, they comment on the investor presentation. Yeah, they did. So it says, okay. uh, in response, the company issued the following statement, the Six Flags board of directors and management team regularly engage with investors and welcome constructive input from all Six Flags shareholders. The company has met with land and building representatives several times over the past few years, including conversations regarding the monetization of real estate assets. The board with its advisors routinely evaluates potential options to unlock shareholder value, including the potential monetization of real estate. Six Flags is encouraged by the early signs of progress against its strategic plan and remains focused on delivering an exceptional guest experience to drive sustainable long-term earnings growth. They said they met with land and building representatives several times over the past few years. Uh huh. So the board has met with them and they were talking to them from before this happened then. Because the CEO and this plan are things that we're talking about that have really been for not few years uh -huh. i mean unless they're saying few years to mean literally two two years in a day or something yeah. but 
what they mean is that they've been talking to them that um, you know landed building unrelated to what this plan that they're carrying out, right? So it's not in response to that. And presumably that would mean landed buildings is not a recent shareholder um, that they haven't bought at these low mm -hmm. prices. Maybe they bought at much higher prices and things like that. We would guess. We don't know that. Which maybe, um, you know, only motivated them to come public more with it because they're underwater. Because that Six Flags yeah, thing, I, I mean, obviously it's 3%, right? They own. So we don't know what their average cost basis is. That's not um, disclosed. Right. No, they don't say anything like that. Yeah. So if, but we can look at Six Flags and their um, market cap and stuff today and see that um, that their 3% that they have would be what, like, what is that, like $60 million or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ish. 60, yeah. 70 million, something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, no, I, I wouldn't um, buy the stock today because of that. that doesn't mean that I would say no to it. I would just follow it really closely. A lot of times, I look at a stock because I think it's interesting and I follow it because it's interesting, not necessarily because I'd be very close to buying it, but it's not an interesting situation. I think this is interesting and has potential as something to research and to follow and to think about, but I don't um, necessarily think that it would be something that I would buy today. I mean, I know that it is not something that I would buy today. Mm -hmm. There's too much being changed in too short a period of time and the possibilities of very different kind of outcomes is really high. Um, so... Yeah, you know, that's the Buffett sort of thing of not investing in business with a ton of different change. Um, this is changing stuff about the really core stuff about the business of really the the pricing and the experience for people of why they go to Six Flags. You're changing everything about that potentially. And you saw how much attendance dropped and how much per capita spending increased. So you got very different reaction from how it was, um, how it was, uh, the, the, the service was used and stuff. I mean, it's really very different when you do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, who, who's used to, when did you, when has anyone had experience investing in a business in which unit sales dropped 30% and price increased 50%? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you saw that, you would say, this is a wildly different business from what it's been in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And effectively, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Yeah, the per capita spending isn't the same thing as price exactly, and tennis isn't exactly the same thing as the unit volume, but it's very similar from the customer's perspective, right? So you attracted a whole different kind of customer in terms of the mix that you had. There was a big shift in the mix, obviously, um, of what they're using and how they're using and what they're valuing. Uh, so you could really be annoying a huge part of your base that maybe they rely on each year in terms of sales of like season tickets and things like that, season passes. And um, you also could be bringing in a whole another group of people that haven't that are maybe lapsed customers or totally new customers and uh it could be really different how their experience is and i haven't been um to i mean i would have to like visit some parks and stuff to get a better idea of what's really happening uh i mean i've heard from land and buildings and i've heard from the ceo basically mm -hmm. um you know and and what their ideas about it are um and their impressions of it and so i just think there's a huge amount of change now if you're going to do it, I would say, I don't know what the pricing on it and stuff is, but like something like the leaps or something is likely because you have a pretty high, the, the risk here, why you wouldn't do it is not that the upside is insufficient. The upside's good. Uh, the problem is that the, the, the probability of very large loss in the equity is probably a lot bigger than people might think. Okay. So that's the issue of um, the risk to that because it has debt. It needs to spend on CapEx. It could quickly spiral out of control, especially if things coincide in a way that they don't want to have happen. So, you know, which is always these stories of how things go bad for a company is they're trying to carry out some transformational thing at the same time that the economic situation or whatever is against them in the same way. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of like, do I think this has a higher likelihood of working out than like Cinemark? Yeah, I think the likelihood of it working out is higher. Um, because I think the upside is not as different, uh, you know, I mean, cinema's gotten even cheaper, but I said that before, you know, that one of the things about why you want to invest in a movie theater company right now is that there are some companies like Six Flags, which you don't have this existential threat to them. People are, you know, the, the demand's going to be there for theme parks and stuff. So it's just easier than betting on whether there'll be a real return to movie theaters. You don't have to bet on that return for theme parks, but you do have, uh, really big changes that the company is making. And so it's just a huge amount of um, 
like uncertainty based on that, you know, and I'm comfortable with a lot of uncertainty based around other things that are not like core product economics and stuff. That's where I care about a high degree of certainty, right? There's lots of things where I don't know what the company's going to do. And people would say, isn't this uncertain? Whatever. That doesn't bother me. But things that are very core to the business of the, like, that's what we're talking about here. That's usually something in which there's a very high degree of certainty. Like, that's not something that you're changing all the time. We don't have experience investing in, like, startups, tech things that haven't decided what product they're selling and at what price. But right now, this company hasn't decided exactly what they're selling and at what price. Because they might be very different this season from last season. Um, and that's unusual for a mature company to have like wild swings in pricing and stuff. I mean, um, you know, Best Buy turned itself around and made some pretty big changes, I guess. Um, what was it? Uh, JC Penney made huge changes that were very bad for the company. Um, those are the ones that stand out as most similar to me in terms of like how big the changes are that the CEO says they're going to make and like how, what they're going to be and what they're kind of customer they want to have and stuff i'm sure there's other examples but those are the ones the last 10 years or so i remember that kind of remind me of this got it cool well i want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with jeff and myself on the focus compounding podcast uh, it'd be great in 2023 if uh when you come across interesting things that you're not going to buy but you think they're interesting enough to follow if we could just basically do what we did today and go over it and lay it out and uh, follow it on the podcast. So I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself. Go to focuscompounding.com to get access to investment write-ups from Jeff. The best place to get everything that we put out into the investment universe is by following me on Twitter at, at Focused Compound. I want to thank everybody so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.